Let me continue now as we talk about the fruit of the root and the power of forgiveness. Hebrews 12, 12 through 15. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, rather healed. Pursue peace with all people in holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone should fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many are defiled. Father, thank you for the reading of your word, the power of your word, and I thank you right now that your word is going to change us, for you promised it would not return to you void, but it will do the thing that you sent it to do. Thank you today that we're already new people because we have been in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. One of the most difficult portions of scripture I believe for us Christians to live is Romans 12, 19 through 21. And in that portion of scripture, the Apostle Paul says, do not return evil for evil, but good for good for, for evil. And he says, what people do to you when they hurt you, don't give them what they deserve. Forgive them and help them and touch them when they need it. No matter what they have done to you, that is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Because how many of you understand it's the very foundation of our salvation that Jesus did not give us what we deserved. He gave us what we needed. But then Paul takes it a step farther. He says, don't even seek to make people pay for what they've done to you. In other words, don't try and get revenge. He says, leave the revenge to God. But let me tell you what I've observed about most Christians, myself included, at some point in life. I would rather not wait on God because God takes too long sometimes. I want to take revenge into my own hands. In fact, many of you are like that little Korean boy. He was a houseboy for some American soldiers. Sometimes they thought it was funny to play harmless jokes on him. They would tease him. They would tie his shoestrings together. They would lock him in, out of the house. And eventually they realized that their practical jokes were not viewed as funny by the boy. So they apologized. And I love what he said to them. He said, oh, that's okay. Now I'll stop spitting in your soup. Some of you, you've had things happen to you in life. That are so bad, you would want to do something worse than spit in someone's soup. But I like what Jensen Franklin says on the cover of his book, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. He says, getting hurt is part of life. It is inevitable that someone has already broken your heart, abandoned you, left you, said something hurtful to you. Whatever it is, you have loved hard and you've been wounded. And now you are not living fully the way God intended because you don't know how or is it even possible to love like you've never been hurt. But this is not the end of your story. God wants to give you a new beginning, a new story, a fresh start. He wants to heal what has been broken. He wants to reconcile what has been torn apart. Listen closely to what he says next. I get what it's like to be hurt. I'm not telling you to do something I have not done myself and made mistakes along the way trying. I know the temptation to not want to let go of hurt or disappointment. My marriage has had severe tests and struggles, and so has my family. Listen now. But we have learned that God did not intend for us to be the walking wounded. He intended for us, for all of us, to be whole. And the only way to be reconciled, healed, and whole is to love like you've never been hurt. Church, we're going to talk about this on Wednesday nights, how we can come to the place of loving people in spite of what they've done to us. But I want to continue talking this morning about the power of forgiveness because we must understand that you can never, ever truly be emotionally healthy as long as we carry in our souls a spirit of unforgiveness. I talked to you, first of all, about the truths concerning forgiveness. Let me talk today about some truths about unforgiveness. Number one, unforgiveness blocks the flow of God's grace and mercy to our lives. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, and I'm going to read it from the message. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness for God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Above that in verse 6, Jesus says that when you pray, ask the Father to forgive you your debts as you forgive your debtors. And I don't think, church, that most Christians that we really understand, look at me and please understand this. There is a direct correlation between God's ability and the ability to answer your prayers as connected to whether you forgive people and God forgiving you. You see, when it comes to forgiveness, 
There is a favor of God that can only be on the life that understands the power of forgiveness. And then Jesus takes it a step farther. In Matthew 5, 23, he says, this is how I want you to conduct yourselves in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and you are about to make an offering and suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you or vice versa, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Look at me, church. The body of Christ seems to have an illusion in our minds. That somehow we can walk around and we can be angry at people and we can be unforgiving and still have a right relationship with God. We seem to have this illusion in our minds that we can have a wonderful vertical relationship with God without having a right horizontal relationship with our fellow man. And Jesus says, no, you've got it backwards. Jesus says, if you're going to be right with God, you must first be right with one another. And he says, if you don't forgive, your offerings have no favor on them. You need to understand that even if you went through the motions of worshiping today and the praising, if there is unforgiveness in your heart and bitterness, that your praise and your worship was without power. Nothing you bring to God has favor on it if you don't forgive those who have wounded you. Now, I want you to ponder this for a moment. How many prayers have you prayed? That have not been answered. And you said God was not listening when in essence you have blocked his power to work because you have not forgiven. Number two. Unforgiveness is powered by a giant poisonous root of bitterness. Unforgiveness is powered by a giant, giant poisonous root of bitterness. The writer of Hebrews warns us in twelve fifteen, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause, uh, cause trouble, and by this many are defiled. In other words, the writer of Hebrews says to me and to you, to everyone in this room, consistently look at your heart. See that there is no unforgiveness in there and that bitterness does not take a root in your heart because when it does, listen to what he says, it will produce all kinds of negative fruit in your life. And here's the danger. You're not the only one affected by that negative fruit, but everybody connected to you is affected by the negative fruit. Many are infected. Many are, are poisoned by the bitterness in your heart. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, 17, when it comes to Christianity, it is not what the tree claims to be. It is what the tree displays that identifies it as a tree that has good fruit. He said, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree, bad fruit. Listen, church, I see so many Christians who have been set free by the blood of Jesus. We have been delivered from the yokes of bondage. We have been loosed from the bondage and the chains of sin, and yet we walk around carrying these weights and these chains of unforgiveness and these unforgiveness in our spirit. It is driven and powered by a giant poisonous root of bitterness. I was wondering the other day, is it possible for a tree to produce many different kinds of fruit at one time? So I did a little research, and here's what I found. There is a man named Sam Van Aken who grows a tree that might look like any other tree until it blooms. First, its branches bloom in different shades of pink and white and crimson, and then, quite magically, the tree displays mixed fruit. It is known as Van Aken's tree of 40 fruit an invention that is just what it sounds like, which is capable of producing 40 different varieties of fruit, plums and peaches and apples and pears and apricots and nectarines and cherries and others. All these things grow on this one tree. The 42-year-old sculptor and art professor at Syracuse University created his first multi-fruit tree back in 2008. He did it by grafting together branches of different trees. His intention was to produce a piece of natural art that would transform itself. And he thought of the tree as a sculpture because he could, based on what he had grafted where, he would be able to determine how it morphed. 
Today, church, there are 18 of these wondrous trees across the country, with three more being planted in Illinois, Michigan, and California. The process is known as chip grafting, and it works by cutting the buds off of a tree, letting them heal to the branches of the interstock, a section of the tree that forms a new tree trunk. But what is most important for you to understand, and why I'm giving you this information, is that as amazing as this feat is, there is something that is very, very important and it is this because this process that he goes through it is unnatural so is the fruit Van Aken said this he said some of the fruit is so sweet that they will literally hurt your teeth and others are sour the reason being so is that the process is unnatural everybody listen to me for a moment fruit Healthy fruit must be connected to the tree it is meant to be connected to in order to produce a specific type of fruit. But even then, if it's connected to the right tree, the root of the tree must be healthy. Watch this now. The natural process is that a tree produces healthy fruit according to the root. Watch, the root of the tree is the unseen part through which water and nutrients are absorbed from the soil. In essence, it is where the life exists. And if the root is not healthy, the tree will produce unhealthy fruit. Now, why is that important? Church, listen very closely. Read your Bible, and in many places, God refers to you and I as trees. In Psalm 1, 1 through 2, he says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree. Everybody say tree. Planted by the rivers of water, rooted in the rivers of water, that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither whatever he does shall prosper I love Isaiah 61 1 through 3 because it really speaks of how we're supposed to operate when we're healthy trees the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the joy of mourning, for the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. Now stop right there. What do you hear God saying? What do you hear Isaiah saying? Jesus quoted that scripture in Luke 4, 16 through 19 because it was about him. And don't miss what he was saying. He is saying and Isaiah is saying that I didn't come to heal part of you. I came to heal all of you. I came to heal you spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Why? Because the rest of Isaiah verse 3 says that they may be called trees. Everybody say trees. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that they may be glor that he may be glorified. I want you to hear this. God says, I came to make you a healthy tree so that the way that you live gives glory and honor and praise to my name. And we are living in a time, Christians, where we are so driven by our emotions that many times we are meaner than those who don't know the Lord. This is important because if the their heart is filled with unforgiveness. It means your emotional root system is poisoned with bitterness. It's unhealthy. And the health of your, 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 your emotional roots are of vital import. Because you need to understand, whatever the condition of your emotional roots is the kind of fruit that your life will produce. And the fruit that your life produces is your testimony. It tells the people of the world who you really are, not who you say you are. And I'm going to say it one more time. I am glad that you got saved. I am glad that you love Jesus. But getting saved and loving Jesus is not enough to help you overcome wounded emotions. Loving Jesus is not enough to help you have a healthy life. If you don't get the healing you need of your wounded emotions, and your wounded emotions will never be healed as long as the roots of bitterness reside in your soul. What are some of the roots of bitterness? Let me give you some of them. One of the roots, uncontrollable outburst of anger. I was watching TV the other day, and I found out 
That anger, when it is controlled, is a healthy emotion. And the church of Jesus Christ could use to get a little more controlled, righteous anger about what angers the heart of God instead of us being so wimpy and so mealy mouth and compromising. But the Bible gives this word in Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. How do you accomplish being angry and not sinning at the same time? He goes on to say, the Apostle Paul, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. In other words, when you become angry, when you get hurt, when you get wounded, deal with it in that time. Don't let time lapse and sit and simmer and seek to, to bury it within yourself. Let God help you in the beginning. Dr. David Jeremiah said this, to avoid sinning in the heat of anger, God's people should not nurse, rehearse, discuss, or project their anger on others. Instead, they should control their anger and deal with it quickly to prevent the enemy from gaining any ground in their hearts. Listen, when it comes to wounds and when people hurt me, here's what I try to live by. I don't curse it. I don't nurse it. I try not to rehearse it. I disperse it, and then I find out that somehow God will reverse it. Now watch this. But what we wounded do too many times is we sit on it and we rehearse it and we begin to simmer and we become walking time bombs. As I stated earlier, I was watching TV the other day and there was a young man who was raised in an extremely abusive home and he gave his heart to Jesus but he never dealt with his anger that he had toward his father. And he was prone to sudden explosions of anger and he talked about how people would look at him the wrong way and it would immediately burst into a physical altercation. He got married and his wife, she asked him, please get help for the anger you have towards your father. And though they were both Christians, he refused. And he said something to this effect, I will never forgive him. It is the bitterness in my heart toward him that gives me a reason to live and it's what drives me. Then they had a baby. You know how newborns are. They sleep when you don't sleep. They're awake when you're not awake. They cry, cry, cry for a season. And one day he'd had enough of that two-month-old baby crying. He picked that baby up and he shook that baby and he slammed him in that crib. And he said, shut up. Hours later, they found that baby in that crib dead. And we found him on TV sitting in prison. And he made this statement. I didn't mean to hurt my baby. I just lost, lost it. Got to get help if you're that bitterness out of there. A second fruit is People who operate in a root of bitterness are easily offended by the blessings of others. How many of you know people? They want to be blessed, but the moment you get blessed, they don't need all that stuff. They just get angry. I knew a man, every time somebody got blessed, he would sit and he'd look at me and he'd go, I don't know why they're getting that. They don't need that. When you're bitter, you don't want other people to be blessed. A third fruit is critical of most things. You show me a person that's always criticizing something, and I will show you that that person has a root of bitterness on the inside. In growing up in the church that I grew up in in Illinois, the, 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 the pastor's wife, who was the pastor before my father became the pastor of that church, we grew up in that church. And that woman, all the days of my life, from growing up from here to here, I always looked at her, and even as a child, I said, God, why is she so bitter? She was so bitter. She was so mean. She was so critical of everything. I'll never forget when I first brought my wife to church, my wife had on a dress where the sleeve was right here. That woman had not even met my wife, walked right up to her, stuck her finger up her sleeve and said, you ain't saved. And I looked at her so bitter. I'll never forget that my parents, they came to visit us in, in our church in this church and they saw our children's church and they said when we go back home we want to start a children's ministry and that mother who stayed in that church all those years she shut them down and said we don't need all that noise underneath us she was more concerned about herself than the children and bitterness will do that listen church she was such a bitter woman that when she died I'm not making this up people came to her funeral to be sure she was actually dead 
My parents told me that there were people who walked by. They said, I'm going to touch her to make sure she's really dead. Listen to me. Bitterness. It will make you critical, and it will drive you to the grave. Number four, people who are, are, are stung by the fruit of bitterness, they find joy in the failure of others. I am amazed at how many preachers rejoice when another preacher falls under condemnation and under sin, and he messes up, and I hear preachers rejoicing. I have literally heard preachers say, well, you know what? Now they'll come to our church. Another fruit, the inability to submit to authority. I never have trouble with someone who is emotionally healthy. But the emotionally unhealthy, you can't get them to, to cooperate if you tied them down. Number six, unhealthy people, bitter people, a constant need to slander other people. Listen to people talk. If they're always slandering other people, there is a root of bitterness on the inside of them. And then there's one more that I've observed. When a person is stung and their root is poisoned, the retelling of hurts and offenses, they tell them with the same pain or venom as if it happened today. Let me illustrate it this way. When Lady Brenda and our family moved here, there was a minister I had not seen for 15 years. He found out we were here. He drove all the way down from somewhere up north because he wanted to come talk to me. When he walked into my office, it took about two minutes for him to launch into the same tirade that got him fired 15 years ago. And he starts telling it, and he's telling it that day like it happened that day. And his teenage, his young boys are sitting there listening to their father talk. And my heart broke because Jessica and Shauna never knew the magnitude of the things we went through until they were grown women. They thought the people that we pastored walked on water. Here is my point. What I'm trying to say is that when you are emotionally unhealthy and bitterness runs through your soul, you will tell the story 15, 20, 30 years later just like it just happened a few hours ago and one more thing about people filled with bitterness eventually they'll turn on each other that couple ended up divorced see a third thing that we need to know about the root about unforgiveness is that bitterness makes the bitter person its victim watch this now what will bitterness do number one bitterness will dominate you mentally as you allow the root of bitterness to grow, it will make more and more, of, uh, it will take over more and more of the soil of your soul. There is a plant in southern states in the USA called kudzu. Kudzu is a vine plant that grows like wildflower fire and it takes over everything it can. Kudzu can grow up to one foot per day and up to 100 feet in a single growing season. It chokes out native paths and it takes over everything in its path. Listen, it is the same way with bitterness. It will consume you and absorb you like a magnet. Let me talk to your dear heart for a moment. I want to ask you a question. Do you find yourself constantly focused on the person that hurt you? Do you find yourself dreaming about the person that wounded you? Do you find yourself having nightmares about what they did to you? You, and it was years ago. A brilliant doctor by the name of S.I. McMillan wrote a best-selling book entitled None of These Diseases. There he points out how destructive emotions such as bitterness can consume a man both physically and mentally. Listen to what Dr. McMillan said. The moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I can't enjoy my work anymore because he even controls my thoughts. My resentments produce too many stress hormones in my body. I become fatigued after only a few hours few hours of work. Please listen. The man I hate hounds me wherever I go. I can't escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. The man I hate may be many miles from my bedroom, but more cruel than any slave driver. He whips my thoughts into such a frenzy that my inner spring mattress becomes a rack of torture. The lowliest of serfs can sleep, but not I. I really must acknowledge the fact that I am a slave to every man whom I pour my vile wrath. Bitterness will dominate you mentally. Number two, bitterness will depress you emotionally. It will depress you emotionally. There is no depressant I know like bitterness. 
If you look closely, you find that there are no happy, bitter people. Anybody ever met any happy, bitter people? I haven't met any. I've met a whole lot of them with lemons in their mouths. You know what rules their hearts? Criticism, cynicism, negativism, pessimism are the marks of the bitter person. Listen, bitterness will so depress you, it will so sadden you, where it can get you to the point where you can't even function normally. Edwin Martin was a great poet who, having reached the age of retirement, he found out that a, ban a banker had defrauded him out of a great sum of money. Instead of retiring to the life of ease that he thought he had earned, he was penniless and he was broke. And he became so bitter that he could no longer even write poetry. Listen to me, church. The candle of joy had been blown out in his heart by a blaze of bitterness. He became so obsessed with wanting to do this man harm that all he could think of was this. He brewed over it. He stewed over it. He was so obsessed that he began to scheme and to dream how he would get even. And one day in a depressed mood, he took out a pen and a piece of paper, and he sat at his desk, and he was doodling, and he was drawing in circles on his paper, and he was thinking about this banker and how he was going to get that man. And all of a sudden, he said, the Holy Spirit said to me, Markham, if you don't deal with this thing, it's going to ruin you. You cannot afford the price that you are paying you must forgive that man he said immediately I said to the father Lord I will forgive I do freely forgive him watch now the moment he said that Markham said I could feel the root of bitterness being pulled out I could feel the river of joy flowing in me once again he took out his pen and he wrote what was probably his most famous poem it's called outwitted listen to this he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. Do you realize, church, how bitterness will dam up the joy of juices that God wants to flow through your life. That's why it needs to be broken. And listen to me, you need to take out a sledgehammer in the spirit realm and you need to shatter bitterness. When Lady Brenda and I were out with her newfound family. She's got this one brother. His name is Rick. And uh, the dude's hilarious. And he just talks and talks and talks and talks. And, and he, he had me laughing so hard that my jaws were hurting. And finally, Brenda's mother looked at her and said, does he always laugh like that? And she said, oh, yes, he does. That's the way my husband is. Let me tell you something, church. I've had my pains in life. I've been lied to and I've been lied on. I've been misrepresented and misinterpreted. I know what it's like to have your kindness and your goodness trampled on when you did things for people, not because you had to, but because you want to. But let me tell you what I learned about life. Happiness, that, that, that is, is a thing that comes and goes. Happiness is based on situations and circumstances. But joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And when you're moving in the Spirit, the only thing that can happen, the only thing that can take your joy is that you allow the devil to steal your joy. And I am determined that there is no demon in hell. There is no person on earth. There is no situation. There is no circumstance that can steal my joy. Because as long as I got joy, there is hope. And as long as I got hope, I know that all things are possible. <laughs> Thirdly, bitterness will debilitate you physically. Please don't take this lightly. Bitterness sickens your body. Dr. McMillan, in that same body, enumerated over 50 years of diseases ranging from ulcers to high blood pressure that can be caused by bitterness. Some of you don't need a blood pressure pill. You need to forgive. Come on, somebody. And I'm not saying that every sick person is bitter nor that every bitter person is sick, but I am telling you this, every person who remains bitter will be affected physically. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was preaching one Sunday in a church in New Jersey after the service, a woman came up to see him. And I'm not making this up. You've got to listen to this story. He's a younger woman, well-dressed and attractive. She said to him, I always itch. I have an itch that I cannot get rid of. Listen now, it itches worse when I go to church. Can you help me? 
Well, after talking further with her, Dr. Peel called up her personal physician. The doctor told him that he could find nothing physically or organically wrong with this lady and had concluded that she had some kind of neurosis or an obsession that he described as an inner mental eczema. A scratching on the inside that to her seemed to be on the skin. Then the doctor told the preacher that he knew that she had had a sister and that she and her sister had had a falling out years ago. And there was a great deal of bitterness involved in their life and that could be the cause of the problem. When Dr. Peel confronted the woman and her sister, she broke down and she admitted that they had a falling out years ago over a dispute concerning the disposition of the will. A minor disagreement blew up into a major argument. They had a tremendous falling out, and this woman made up her mind. She said, I will never speak to my sister again. Watch now. It was at that exact moment that the itching started. You can't make this stuff up. Dr. Peel, first of all, had her confess her sin of bitterness to the Lord and asked her to take the bitterness and the hate away, asked God to take the, the hate and the bitterness away. Then he asked her to call her sister and ask her to forgive her. When she hung up the phone, the lady looked at Dr. Peel and said, it's amazing, I don't itch anymore, and she has not itched since that day. Now, I know because I can see it on some of your faces. Come on, Bishop, that's ridiculous. Let me tell you something. I had come across my desk the other day a study from John Hopkins Medical Center. It says whether it's a simple spat with your spouse or a long-held resentment toward a family member or friend, unreconciled conflict can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your health. Studies have found that the act of forgiveness can have huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, and anxiety levels, depression, and stress. In Acts 8.23, Peter told a group of people, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness. Church, listen to me. Bitterness is a poison not only to the soul. It has the power to mess you up physically. And I love how doctors like to say and proclaim something that they think they learned that God said over thousands of years ago. God said, a merry heart. <laughs> Woo, glory. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Tickle somebody. No, no, don't do that. Tell somebody. Why don't you laugh a while? Why don't you smile a while? A merry heart does good like medicine, but hardness of the heart, it makes the bones brittle. Number four, bitterness will defile your relationships. It's amazing to me how many Christians, we get lost and upset about things that don't matter in the scheme of eternity. Minus sexual abuse and domestic and abuse and rape, things of that nature. I want to ask you something. Is there anything in life that is so terrible that family and friends cannot do what God does with us? When we mess up, he says in Isaiah 118, come here. Let's reason together. Let me have a conversation with you. And let me wipe away your sin. And when I get done wiping it, it'll be white as snow. It'll be like it never existed. Let me say something. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But yet God reasons with us. Because number five, bitterness will divide fellowship. Now let me talk to you for a moment. There is an atmosphere. Church, listen to me. Some of us feel it. Some of you need to get the feeling. There is an, an, an atmosphere of expectancy that is in this house that has never been felt before. And we all know that at Eagle Heights Cathedral, we believe that the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. And I am convicted that we are imminently standing on the precipice of the greatest breakthrough this house has ever known. That the Holy Ghost is hovering and he's waiting to give us the powerful breakthrough. But listen to me very closely. There's a momentum in this place, but let me talk to you for a minute. You want to stop that momentum? Just harbor bitterness at somebody else who's in this house. I want you to listen to me. The only thing that can derail vision is division. We're all human. 
And at times, we'll give each other reason to be offended. Listen to me. Christians are wonderful when you first meet them. Oh, yeah. Every Christian is wonderful when you first. But stay with us long enough. Some of us will offend you intentionally, some unintentionally, but hear the Holy Ghost. There will always be in this kingdom enough offense for you to grab one. And if you hold on to it, it'll turn into a root of bitterness. And the writer of Hebrews told us that when that happens, many are defiled, defiled, contaminated, polluted, corrupted, poisoned, ruined. But Bishop, you don't know what they did to me. You, you don't know what they said to me. Listen to me. I'm not minimizing what happened to you. What I am telling to you is that you need to do something that is very vital today. Some of you need to start growing up. It's time to mature to the place that when something painful happens to you, you can let it go. Let me talk to you. I'm going to tell you something that we don't want to hear. God allows us to be hurt sometimes as a test. God sits up in heaven and he looks down and he says, I'm going to let them go through this because I want to measure whether they have matured or not. What is their level of maturity? I'm going to sit there and I'm going to watch it. I'm going to see, are you going to become bitter or are you going to become better? Sometimes he allows valleys, valleys to cut into your soul because he can use the valleys as a channel through which he can transmit grace to others if you will allow him to heal your wound by leaving it in the hands of the great physician and not taking it into your own hands. Let me talk to to you. I have preached in some churches that are going to have to have some funerals before they can ever go forward in God because some of those members are making conscious decision to harbor bitterness and until those people die to themselves there will never be a revival in that house. There will never be anointing in that place. Listen to me. You got to learn to let go of some stuff. Because number six, if you don't bitterness will deprive you of blessing and destiny. Lady Brenda has family members who ask her, how can you be all right after the way your family, your adopted family treated you? Lady Brenda decided long before her mama and daddy went into the grave, she wasn't going to let what they did to her control her life. Let me talk to you for a minute. If you will learn to let go of some stuff, you might find out that the stuff that you went through was actually Romans 628 working in your life where God is trying to make the thing that was bad turn it into something good so that he might be glorified. I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say. Lady Brenda and I are sitting and talking with her family and I'm not going to give all the details, but I'm going to say this, that the man who married her mother, who was claiming to be the father, that man was about as evil as a man on two legs can be. He abused all of those children, and her oldest brother said this to her. He says, you know what? God knew what he was doing because had you been in this family, you would have suffered from our abuse. God spoke to me, and he said, as evil as her family was that adopted her, it was the lesser of two evils. And God took what the enemy made for evil, and he made it for good, and she was in that home. And I am telling you this, church, and I want you to really hear what I'm about to say. I am convinced that Lady Brenda would have been dead had she gone into that family that she biologically was birthed into. Let go. Because number seven, bitterness will destroy you spiritually. You can't truly worship with bitterness in your heart. You can't pray effectively with bitterness in your heart. You can't truly trust God with bitterness in your heart. There's this thing that I want to read to you again years ago that Bishop T.D. Jakes said. And every once in a while I read it. And you know what I love about it? When I, when I pulled this out, God said, you know, this is for you too. I said, cool. Listen to it. There are people who can walk away from you. And hear me when I tell you this. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't want you to try to talk another person into staying with you, loving you, calling you, caring about you, coming to see you, staying attached to you. I mean, hang up the phone. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. Your destiny is never tied to anybody that left. People leave you, listen now, because they are not joined to you. And if they are not joined to you, you can't make them stay. Let them go. And it doesn't mean that they are a bad person. It just means that they're part in your story. 
story is over and when you've got to know when people's part in your story is over so that you don't keep trying to raise the dead. You got to know when it's dead. You got to know when it's over. Let me tell you something. And he says what I say. I got the gift of goodbye. It is the 10th spiritual gift. I believe in goodbye. It's not that I'm hateful. It's just that I'm faithful. And if it takes too much sweat, I don't need it. Stop begging people to stay. Let them go. If you're holding on to something that doesn't belong to you and was never intended for your life, then you need to let it go. If you're holding on to past pains, let it go. If someone can't treat you right, love you back, and see your worth, let it go. If someone has angered you, let it go. If you're going on to some thought of evil or revenge, let it go. If you're involved in a wrong relationship or addiction, let it go. If you're holding on to a job that no longer meets your needs or talents, let it go. If you have a bad attitude, let it go. If you keep judging others to make yourself feel better let it go if you are struggling with the healing of a broken relationship let it go if you keep trying to help someone who won't even help themselves let it go if you're feeling depressed and stressed let it go if there's a particular situation that you're used to handling let the past be the past forget the former things listen to me church it is time for some of you to truly let go and let God be God. Slap somebody five and say, let God be God. I'm almost done. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, God brought me back to it. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Here's the conclusion of the matter. There are two times when we are more like, most like Christ. When we forgive and when we give. You can never truly be emotionally healed until you forgive. And God desires to heal. Here's the problem with unforgiveness. Bitterness has a long chain. It will let you seem like you're going somewhere. It'll let you walk and you think you're almost there. And then all of a sudden, you begin to feel the weight. Oh, yeah. Are you hearing me? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Cast off every weight and every sin that so easily besets you so that you might run unbecumbered. Tell somebody, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Come on, somebody. That's the power of forgiveness.